Hello everyone, welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today we're going to discuss process analysis and how we define what credible upset conditions are, and we'll start by discussing the Tomsk 1978 criticality accident, where an insufficient process analysis contributed to the accident. The Tomsk facility site was a plutonium processing facility located in Siberia, and it contained multi-purpose laboratories where plutonium metal ingots were transported, stored, and analyzed in a series of 16 interconnected glove boxes. These glove boxes were manned by seven operators, all of whom were trained to perform any of the tasks performed in the glove boxes. The operators were assigned one specific task at the beginning of their shift, and the site's written procedures required that the operators did not deviate from their one task or assist the other operators with other tasks. The plutonium ingots in these glove boxes were shaped like the frustrum of a cone and were similar in shape to rubber door stops. This operation processed two kilogram ingots of impure plutonium from a waste recovery feed and also processed relatively pure four kilogram ingots produced from plutonium oxide that had been reduced to a metal alpha phase form. These plutonium ingots were stored in polyethylene containers that were sunken into the glove boxes and these containers were lined with cadmium to prevent interaction between different containers. Because the containers were internal cavities that were sunk into the glove box, operators couldn't see whether or not a container held any ingots or how many ingots the container might hold. Each container was limited to hold either one 4 kilogram ingot or up to two 2 kilogram ingots. However, the containers were large enough to contain multiple ingots. Because of this, administrative limits were in place to prevent multiple 4 kilogram ingots from being placed into the same container, and because of operator training, proficiency, and oversight, it was not considered credible for more than 2 ingots to be placed within the same container. The Tomsk 1978 criticality accident took place in Glove Box 13, which contained 7 ingot containers, as well as stations for extracting samples from the ingots, station 1391-A, a a station for weighing and staging, 1391-B, and a station for measuring the dimensions of the ingots, station 1392. There was no limit on the number of ingot containers in glove box 13, thanks to the separation provided by cadmium, but because the ingot characterization took place in this glove box, administrative limits required that no more than one ingot be placed into each given container. This figure displays the ingot containers as if they were set in a straight line, but in reality, containers 4 and 5 were actually behind containers 6 and 7. This made visual inspection of the containers, which again were below grade in the glove box, even more difficult. On December 13, 1978, sample analysis had been completed for every ingot in glove box 13 except for ingot number 3, and so, These other six ingots were to be transferred to glove box number six for further use. After they were transferred, ingots were to be transferred back into glove box 13 from glove boxes six and 12. The operator, who we'll call operator A, started this process by transferring ingots six and seven out to glove box six, after which he transferred in ingots eight and nine from glove box six. However, after completing this step, Operator A asked another operator, who we'll call Operator B, to help with moving out ingots 1 and 2, which violated their procedure for having only one operator work on any given task. Operator A left the area, and instead of transferring out ingots 1 and 2, Operator B, whose transfer process is shown using this dashed line, transferred ingot 3 into the container already holding ingot 4. Operator B then transferred ingot 10 from glove box 6 into the container that had previously held ingot 3. This violated the intended procedure since the new ingot from glove box 6 was to be placed in either container 1 or container 2. Operator A then returned and relieved operator B of their duties, but failed to confirm the transfers that operator B had performed. Possibly because operator A had expected containers 1 and 2 to be empty, operator A whose transfers are marked with this solid line, decided to move ingots 1 and 2 out of their containers and, without checking the contents of their destination container, placed both ingots 
into the container that already held ingots 3 and 4. This step alone was already a violation of the written procedures because the operator intentionally placed two ingots into the same container. And since this container already contained ingots 3 and 4, adding ingots 1 and 2 resulted in a prompt supercritical excursion and a blue flash. The fourth ingot was actually a 2 kilogram ingot, and it was either ejected by the supercritical excursion or removed by the operator just after the blue flash occurred. The ingot's ejection or removal most likely prevented repeated supercritical excursions from occurring. After the flash, the criticality alarm was sounded and the operators evacuated, but not before operator A removed two of the remaining three ingots from the container, placing them on the left and right ends of the glove box, respectively. This prompt supercritical excursion yielded approximately 3 times 10 to the 15th fissions, and operator A received a 250 rad whole body dose. However, the operator also received up to 2,000 rads to his hands, which had to be amputated at the elbows after the accident. Additionally, the operator's eyesight was impaired following the accident, most likely due to the radiation dose his eyes received. So what factors contributed to this accident? One major factor was the geometrically unfavorable ingot containers, which could hold more than one ingot at a time and were positioned such that the operators couldn't see if a container held any ingots. In fact, after this accident, the containers in this glove box were redesigned so that they could only hold one ingot at a time. Furthermore, the process analysis for this operation deemed that having more than two ingots in the same container was not a credible upset condition because of operator training, proficiency, and oversight. This process analysis was clearly flawed since four ingots ended up in the same container, and today we're going to discuss process analysis in criticality safety operations. Both the ANSI ANS 8.1 section 4.1.2 standard and the ANSI ANS 8.19 section 7.1 standard state that before a new operation with fissionable material is begun or before an existing operation is changed, it shall be determined and documented that the entire process will be subcritical under both normal and credible abnormal conditions. Today, we'll discuss how process analysis is used to quantify what credible abnormal conditions are. The general recipe for process analysis is to first define the normal conditions for the physical material operation and to prove that the system remains subcritical under these conditions. Next, we must define what constitutes a credible upset condition for this operation. We'll discuss how to quantify credible upset conditions later in this lecture, but the ANSI ANS 8.1 standard, section 4.2, provides some guidance for classifying and evaluating credible upset design basis events. Having defined our credible upset conditions, we must also demonstrate that our system will remain subcritical during each possible upset condition. Lastly, we must define our subcritical safety limits and our criticality safety controls and requirements. This may be an iterative process, since our operating parameters and safety limits will depend on how our operation responds to the possible upset conditions. When we demonstrate that our system will remain subcritical under credible abnormal conditions, it's strongly recommended that we adhere to the double contingency principle. The double contingency principle is defined in ANSI ANS 8.1, section 4.2.2, which states that process designs should incorporate sufficient factors of safety to require at least two unlikely, independent, and concurrent changes in process conditions before a criticality accident is possible. This statement is technically optional because it uses the should verb, but it is strongly recommended for an operation to adhere to the double contingency principle whenever possible. This makes sense, since a process that is only one mistake away from an accident really isn't that safe. In fact, the double contingency principle used to be mandated with a shall statement, and some criticality safety engineers still think that it should use a shall statement. However, some operations are not flexible enough to comply with the double contingency principle 
but can incorporate enough margin and training to protect against the one change in process conditions that can lead to a supercritical configuration. It's also worth noting that the double contingency principle states that we must protect against two independent changes to process conditions. This is important because one credible abnormal condition can cause multiple correlated changes to process conditions. Let's walk through some example double contingency principle scenarios to explain what I mean by this. Say that our facility handles containers filled with UO2 powder, and let's consider a scenario where a worker accidentally overfills one of our containers. In this case, we have one credible abnormal condition, which is the worker accidentally overfilling the container. And this one condition causes one change in process conditions, a loss of mass control in the container. So here, one credible abnormal condition causes exactly one change in process conditions. Let's look at another scenario where we have a facility that houses containers filled with plutonium oxide in storage tanks. Say that our facility is located in an earthquake zone, and one credible abnormal condition is an earthquake hitting the facility. If the earthquake is strong enough, then perhaps it can 1. cause the racks to tip over, 2. cause some of the containers to break, which might cause the plutonium oxide to pool in a pile somewhere, and 3. either cause the fire sprinklers to go off or cause the overhead water lines to rupture. In this case, we have one credible abnormal event, an earthquake, that causes three correlated non-independent changes to process conditions, which results in a loss of interaction control, geometry control, volume control, moderation control, and reflection control. These three process changes are not independent. They are correlated because they are likely to occur together after one single initiating event. So a process analysis that was subcritical for all three of these process changes would not satisfy the double contingency principle because these three changes in process conditions are not independent. So let's work with some more process analysis examples and see what we need to do to satisfy the double contingency principle. Here, let's say that a glove box houses tanks containing plutonium nitrate solution and that these two changes to process conditions are credible. One, a worker could rupture a tank, causing its contents to accumulate in the corner. And two, a tank could be overfilled. Let's assume that our system is subcritical for situation one, subcritical for situation two, and subcritical for situations both one and two simultaneously. Now, does this operation satisfy the double contingency principle? It depends. As long as situations one and two are independent, unlikely, and concurrent events, then this example would in fact satisfy the double contingency principle. If an overfilled container is more likely to rupture, then the two situations are correlated and the double contingency principle is not satisfied. If the containers are routinely overfilled in this operation, then situation number two is not unlikely, and thus the double contingency principle is not satisfied. Likewise, if overfilling a container is likely and is unlikely to be detected for a while, then the situation ceases to be concurrent since overfilled containers might always be floating around the facility, and thus the double contingency principle is not satisfied. If we introduce a third credible abnormal event, which is the glove box tipping over and collapsing, and we assume that our system is subcritical after all of these events, then now do we satisfy the double contingency principle? As long as these events are independent, unlikely, and concurrent events, then we do. If these events happen to not be independent, then one possible option is to add controls to the system so that they now are independent. For example, we could strengthen the glove box's structural supports so that a ruptured tank is not likely to tip over the glove box. Also, we could strengthen the plutonium nitrate containers so that overfilling does not make them more likely to rupture. So what constitutes a credible upset condition? Consulting with the facility's operators and their supervisors is perhaps the most effective way of determining what an operation's credible abnormal conditions are. When doing this, it's helpful to run through a what-if list to see what could go wrong at different times throughout the operation. For example, we might start asking if a glass can break to cause a loss of geometry control. We might ask 
What is the likelihood of the glass breaking? Has it ever broken before? How can the glass break? Are there any events that might cause the glass to break and could cause other changes to process conditions as well, such as a rack of fissile material containers tipping over and falling onto the glass container? Also, are there any design basis accidents, such as an earthquake or a tornado or a hurricane, that could change these process conditions? And what is the consequence of the failure? What happens if the glass vial breaks? And does the rate of failure matter? A water main that leaks a couple of drops of water each day isn't going to affect our moderation control anywhere near the extent as a double guillotine waterline break. So a good generic roadmap for determining credible abnormal upset conditions includes considering can something, the container, the room, flood with water? Can people affect the reactivity to a significant degree? Can the mass of fissile material be exceeded? If so, then by how much? Can the shape of the tank change? If so, where does the solution go? Does it spill out somewhere? And if it spills, where does it accumulate? Next, can the fissile material precipitate out of solution and get deposited somewhere unexpected? Can multiple carts, wagons, or units be present to interact with each other? Are there any fissile gases that are likely to enter the area? And lastly, can an array or storage rack collapse, resulting in a loss of interaction control? So those are some credible abnormal upset conditions that we need to consider. Now what are some conditions that we don't need to consider? Criticality safety evaluations do not need to consider the following abnormal conditions. First, fissile material workers who are untrained or unqualified. Second, workers who ignore procedures or who might willfully ignore safety protocols. And lastly, we do not need to consider any acts of terrorism or intentional sabotage. So criticality safety evaluations instead assume that these events are not credible. If any of these events, however, are credible, then fissile material operations must immediately be paused until the offending conditions can be fixed. We cannot prevent a criticality accident if workers are intentionally trying to cause an accident or if they are grossly ignoring safety limits and it's not reasonable for us to design fissile material operation limits around intentionally unsafe actions. Instead, we must guarantee that these unsafe conditions are not credible during fissile material operations. So I've mentioned that we can work with operators and their supervisors to determine what the credible abnormal conditions are, but how likely does an event need to be to be considered a credible abnormal event? Appendix A of the ANSI ANS 8.1 standard outlines the likelihood of credible, unlikely, and incredible events. The field of probabilistic risk assessment, or PRA, also does this for its accidents, and we can compare the likelihood of different events as shown in this table. Normal and credible abnormal events can be expected to occur more often than once every 100 years. Unlikely events should occur about once every 1,000 to 10,000 years and incredible events should happen less than about once every 10,000 to 100,000 years. Different sites might use facility-specific failure probabilities for passive, active, and administrative controls in place of the numbers in this table. However, these numbers can be used as a rough guide for determining the threshold between what is credible, unlikely, and not credible. Now lastly, it's important to remember that what is credible depends on the situation and on the operation's history. The likelihood of double batching probably depends on how often double batching has occurred before, and the likelihood of triple or quadruple batching, which happened during the Tomsk 1978 accident, depends on the formality of operations and also how often double batching occurs. If operators routinely pause their tasks and trade tasks with other operators, like during the Tomsk 1978 accident, then double batching is probably more likely. Similarly, if we cannot see or tell how full a container is, then double batching is also probably likely. After all, how many of us have forgotten how many cups of flour we've been adding to a container while we were trying to bake something? I certainly have, and so now I always weigh flour when I add it using a scale so that I know how much I've added, so that I'm less likely to add an extra cup of flour. We should always have these kinds of discussions with fissile material operators and their supervisors so that we know how they actually do their work and how likely different credible abnormal conditions are. 
This concludes our lecture on process analysis, the double contingency principle, and determining credible upset conditions. This knowledge might feel a little theoretical right now, but we'll exercise it soon in some homework assignments. Our next lecture will review the Tokamura criticality accident and will review the kinetics of a supercritical transient.